Okay. So yes, thank you for joining us. I think we should start with a round of introductions. I don't think everyone knows each other. I think everyone knows me, so I won't bother um, boring you with that. But we can, um, uh, Hossein, maybe you could start. I think you're probably the one that the fewest of us uh, have met before. Oh, you're, you're muted. You're muted, Hossein. Uh, I am an assistant professor, Department of Mechanical um, Engineering, and also Department of uh, Biomedical Engineering, University of Alberta. I am also an, uh, a research affiliate um, at Glen Rose Rehab Hospital um, in, in Edmonton. So Glen Rose Rehab Hospital is the main rehab hospital of the city um, uh, in Edmonton. Um, I do uh, conduct a good portion of my uh, clinical research over there. So my fields of research are um, mostly related to um, musculoskeletal biomechanics, um, assistive and rehabilitative technology development, um, and also uh, variable biomedical engineering, uh, variable biomedical technology uh, development. Uh, most, of I mean, my, most of my research is about the uh, development of uh, technology for um, for, uh, for uh, in-field um, motion and health assessment, typically with variable technologies, with applications in biomedical engineering, sports science, and ergonomics. Um, that was summary. That's great. Thank you very much. Yes, welcome. Um, why don't we go to Kathy next? Kathy, we're just introducing ourselves briefly. All right, so I am... Uh... Kathy Pokora Fuller, and I am Professor Emeritus from Psychology at U of T, and Adjunct Professor in Gerontology at Simon Fraser, and I moved from Toronto to the West Coast, and I work with uh, Jenny Campos and with Walter Wittich, and we are part of the Sensory Cognitive team for the Canadian Consortium on Neurodegeneration and Aging. So we are the sensory people. Uh, as and, and with a focus on how sensory and cognitive um, impairments um, interact with each other. So whatever, whatever has to do with communication, I would say that's where we can help. Beautiful, thank you. Um, why don't we go to Cesar? Sure. Uh, so I, I think I introduced myself briefly last time, but my name is Cesar Marcus Chin. I'm an assistant professor at the Institute of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Toronto. And I'm also a scientist at the Kite Research Institute, which is the research arm of the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute. Uh, I really have a background in medical instrumentation and rehabilitation. Uh, I started uh, and, and uh, spinal cord injury uh, back in the 90s. Yeah. Uh, before starting my work in academia, I, I did sort of uh, very clinical work uh, uh, focused primarily on assistive technologies to um, access computers and, and uh, that type of thing. Uh, for a while, I worked also uh, in industry, developing uh, prosthetic devices, as well as uh, 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 you're going to laugh, but it was augmentative or prediction systems, right? In which uh, you would start typing a word and it would try to guess what you were typing, <laughs> which is, of course, not what you have all in your in your pocket on your cell phone, right? But um, I, I was the guy who created the mathematical models to make that prediction. Then uh, I was strict into going back to grad school, and ever since I've been, <laughs> I've been working more on neurorehabilitation. I, 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 I just like uh, Kathy works on communication. I work on voluntary movement, so I, I keep working in the area of uh, or, or with the uh, individuals with cord injury as well as uh, stroke. Uh, my thing is I create machines that connect directly to the nervous system, so I put sometimes electrodes directly on the surface of the brain or sometimes uh, uh, outside on the person's head, right? And I combine that with electrical stimulation and I use that as a form of treatment uh, to help people recover the ability to move uh, voluntarily. But uh, a good portion of my heart still lies in, in uh, sort of uh, assistive devices. And, and now that my best man has a spinal cord injury and I would say 90% of my friends have a spinal cord injury as well. So that's me. Great, thank you. Um, we'll go to Ziad. 
Yes, uh, wow, you all have done so much. I'm just an undergraduate student, uh, third year, uh, pursuing biomedical engineering uh, at Guelph. And I joined uh, the engineering health team uh, back in January uh, to work on this project, so the uh, National Parks project, as well as other projects surrounding the accessibility. Uh, so yeah, I'm interested in improving the accessibility and, and researching uh, with the team. And uh, today I'll be presenting uh, the project helping uh, with the team, presenting the projects, and I'll look for some feedback from everyone. So yeah, thank you so much and nice to meet everyone. And I disagree, Zia, that you're just another undergrad. You're a very special undergrad. Um, so Wakas. Much. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Wakas. I am a research analyst in the Lake team. I joined the team last summer uh, during one of my co-ops. Um, so I've been working on a couple of accessibility, accessibility projects with the team, uh, one of them being the evacuations from um, the built environment for individuals with disabilities, um, as well as uh, this project, the National Parks Project. Um, and I'm primarily right now working on the website and website development, and I'll be hopefully helping Ziad in the very near future with some of the work that he's doing as well um, with developing the matrices. So yeah, that's me. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Allison. Hi, I'm Allison. I joined the team back in February. Um, I did my master's a few years ago uh, in communications, assistive communications, and focusing on um, quality controls for live closed captioning. And I also have an extensive background in public policy development and policy analysis. Uh, so that's what I'm bringing to the table. Perfect. And Mark, I think, is the last one. So my name is Mark Weiler. I'm a librarian at Wilfrid Laurier University, and I'm helping out uh, by focusing on the, um, the scoping review to a large extent. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. So our goal that I, we didn't miss anyone, did we? That's everybody. Yeah, good. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the goal today is really just to bring you up to speed on what some of us had been doing. Um, you know, this was um, the project, as, as you'll see, the project has been shifting a little bit for a number of reasons. Um, and so, you know, it was a little tricky to figure out the right time to bring us all together because things were so much in flux. I think we're now at a point where we've had, um, a few of us have had a chance to talk to some stakeholders, get our feet a little wet in this area in the project, and we can see the path forward in a way that is, is going to uh, be useful to present to you what, what we're imagining the next couple of years will look like. Uh, but it is very much, uh, you know, up, evolving as we speak. So I think, uh, you know, we're very interested in getting your feedback and, and, and perspectives on how, um, how we move forward. Uh, so I'm going to start just with a very quick overview. I think everyone that's on the line has a, already has a sense of what the big kind of goals are for this project, but I'll just reiterate just for completeness. Uh, you know, we're, we're looking at accessibility of national parks. We're funded by the Accessibility Standards uh, Canada group. Um, and the timeline, initially, this was a three-year project, but because of a number of delays, we're down to basically two years. So that the end of the project is March 31st, 2023. And the, you know, so this is why we've got, the, the project will need to be refined. I, I, I will have to file a, um, uh, an amendment essentially for the agreement that we have now for this project to, to, to adjust a number of things. And so, you know, I think we should feel quite comfortable to uh, make recommendations at this stage and think about how, you know, where, where we think we could do the most good as, as we think about this project here. Um, yeah, at the core of the project, as Allison was bringing up this next slide, the core of the project is what, what we're calling an accessibility matrix. So we're imagining looking at national parks through the lens of the activities that are offered, that, that are offered to all the, the people that visit. Um, so across one axis, we've, we're listing these activities. Um, and down the side, we're thinking about how do each of the different types of individuals with disabilities, uh, how do we help make each of these activities more accessible to each of these types of individuals? Um, Zayad's going to go into far more detail than that, but that's the big picture. We're 
getting gaining information to fill in this matrix from a number of sources. We're going to have park visits. We're going to have surveys and scoping uh, and a scoping review, which will each uh, the members of the team will cover those points in more detail. Um, the, and, and as you'll see, some of how we're gaining this information is changing park visits. We had initially planned to have individuals with disabilities recruit them to go to these parks um, but as we consider now putting in our ethics applications we're a little concerned that it's going to be difficult to get approval and so we're reimagining the way that we do that given our tight tight timeline uh, to, to get to an end, end point here uh, allison will talk more about kind of our, our revised plan uh, that we're proposing for that uh, the matrix itself, the information we gather, we're going to build that matrix iteratively with stakeholders, and, and we'll talk more about who those stakeholders are. And kind of in parallel with the matrix is actually a secondary output here, which is an audit tool. Um, and that audit tool will actually use as part of our park visits, um, but also it'll be an output that hopefully will help uh, parks uh, or other end users rate different parks for how accessible they are. So, um, so that's kind of the overview. I'm suggesting as, as you know, now we'll have uh, Allison, Mark, Zayed, and Wakas go through the different sections of, of, uh, of the project. I'm suggesting if you have quick questions, maybe you're, you're welcome to ask them after each person uh, gives their section, but we'll save kind of more in-depth discussion to the end if that's okay with everyone. Uh, so that's the proposed kind of plan. Does anyone have anything they want to add to the agenda or, or um, anything that we, we need to change? No? Okay, so I'll turn it over to Allison. Thank you. So as uh, Talak mentioned, we've been working through the study um, process and what the park visits will look like. Initially, we were hoping that we could recruit participants to go to the park themselves and then come back and answer some questions, but we're finding that we'll probably run into some challenges with ethics over that. So some alternatives that we're sort of working through and landing on are coming up with um, team members ourselves visiting a park and doing a, an assessment checklist, like a, an audit tool that can take into consideration every single type of disability, assisted device, um, assistive technology that we might need and kind of working through a bit of a checklist and, and an audit tool. And the purpose of us visiting the parks would just be to test this audit tool. And that audit tool would then be kind of a, a supporting document to go with the matrix that would then be handed over to um, ASC. Uh, another option we're considering is work creating a, a series of personas. Um, creating an individual and obviously we would do this while working with stakeholders working with people who have very lived experiences with a disability and basically creating a, a persona of someone who has a mobility disability someone with a hearing impairment someone with a visual impairment and so on and so forth and working through who that person is what um what sort of things they might need what th sort of things they might want to do at a park what sort of um, services or facilities would help them have the best experience possible at a park and kind of creating a, a sort of checklist and a, and a workbook based on that persona that again, one of, one of us on the team would take to a park and kind of pretend to be that person and work through a park visit to see sort of what sort of facilities and, and um, features are available at that park, what are missing, what could be improved upon. So we're working through those at the moment and I'm sure that they're gonna kind of go through a little bit of changes as we kind of massage the ideas and land on something perfect, but that's sort of what we're working on at the moment. And then for surveying um, participants, instead of asking people to visit the park themselves as part of this study and, and compensating them accordingly, we're actually gonna try and recruit people who have visited a national or provincial park in the last 12 months. So when we're advertising and we're reaching out to stakeholders and different organizations, those are the types of people we're gonna be looking for. Someone who's visited a park recently and can tell us about that experience. So we're looking for people with disabilities and their caregivers. And we're asking a series of questions that, that um, include the entire park visit experience. So that's including planning the trip, 
uh, looking on the internet, on the Park Santa website, other Travelocity type websites for in park information, traveling to the park, personal vehicle, public transit, taxi, and then also what accessible features were available at the park. Everything from the parking lot, washrooms, change rooms, footpaths, signage, lighting, seating. We're going to try and cover it all. And then we're also asking about kind of what their motivation for the trip was. Did they enjoy it? Did they feel um, satisfied overall with the trip? And those general questions. And then, of course, prior to that, there's obviously the, the kind of standard demographic questions as well. And we're also giving um, participants the opportunity to opt in for a follow up interview where um, someone on the team would phone them at a you know organized time and kind of do a bit of more of a deep dive into some of the the issues, the obstacles or some of the um, great facilities that were available at the park and the sort of the reasons why. And again, all of this information will help uh, feed into the matrix any additional supporting documents, and then the final report. So currently where we are with the ethics application, um, I believe that everyone was sent the ethics application draft earlier this week. So um, it's out for review with you guys. We are also going through some edits internally. We're hoping to submit it in the next few weeks. I imagine there'll be possibly some revisions from the ethics board. We're hoping to be approved um, in June and start collecting data shortly afterwards. And then for sort of the long term timeline for this project, as Talak mentioned, it's two years. So we want to start, we want to be collecting data over, you know, summer 2021 through to summer 2022. That way we're capturing data through all the seasons and all of the different sports and activities that people do in national parks, you know, skiing, snowshoeing, canoeing, bike riding, everything. Uh, while that's going on, we'll also be doing our own site visits to test the checklists and the audit tools. And we'll also be kind of working through different iterations of the matrix and the scoping review, which Mark will cover shortly. Uh, with the idea of finalizing the matrix in the fall of 2022 and having everything wrapped up and published for March, 2023. Am I doing this? Have I mixed up my years? I think I have. No, we're good. Sorry. <laughs> okay, and scoping review. We can just pause there while Mark's getting ready. But is any quick questions on on any of what Allison went through just before we move on to Mark? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Hussein. We we, we do talk about recommendations. I was wondering. Um, because especially you have been working on these projects since um, I believe more than a year now. Um, which type of recommendations um, would we uh, give to them? Um, is it like changing the infrastructure, changing the paths, changing the accessibility? Can we have some, um, some examples of the type of recommendations that we can have? That would help us understanding um, how we can um, how we can think about possible recommendations. Some recommendations might be so much difficult to be uh, implemented that we don't want to even think about them. Yeah, I, I, I think the basis for this is looking, what the, the way we'd proposed the project was to say, we're going to look at how this is done in other jurisdictions and other places are there, and, and we're looking at standards documents, we're looking at guidelines that other places have created when it comes to um, uh, making parks accessible, national park type spaces accessible, more accessible. And, and I think we're taking our cues from those types of things. So, uh, you know, it could be as simple as how many accessible parking spots do you need? What sizes do those parking spots need to be? Um, to what are the, you know, how do you make uh, getting onto a beach more accessible for someone with a wheelchair? How do you get someone who's, how do you help someone who's blind experience what it's like to be at a lookout? Um, you know, it, it, I, right now I'm, I'm, you know, I think we'll learn more specifics as we go forward. You know, I think there's the, the we're, we're actually not charged with creating the standard, so, you know, ASC, the organization, our funder will create the standard. 
my gut says we could err on the side of being broader. Anything that we learn from our stakeholders that they say, you know, this would help me go and enjoy a park, we could record that. We could record that and so that someone you know, can decide whether that fits in a standard or it fits in a guideline. Or Parks Canada maybe has a way of creating a new type of experience for a particular type of user that doesn't exist now. Uh, you know, these, these sorts of things could, could be in there. I understand, thank you. Thanks. So why don't we move on to Mark? So, so I, I was just oh, wondering, sorry. Um, this idea of asking people who've been to a park in the last 12 months, can I, I asked a dumb question, like, is that actually possible during COVID? I think a lot of people Good question. were not going out and I don't know what the inventory of parks is and how much they have actually been. Open. So if I, if I can address that one, um, I live near a few very large national parks um, in Canada. And last summer they saw a huge decrease in international tourists, but a huge increase in domestic tourists. A lot of people who live in the city um, who can't go on their regular vacations or travel have been going out to, certainly to the the local national parks around here and the provincial parks. So they, they did see a huge uptick in kind of domestic day trips. I, I can just echo what Alison uh, said. I, I'm one of them going to um, national park or provincial parks every other weekend, whenever it's warm enough. So um, yeah. So it means that the people who are going to be potential respondents are gonna be the people local to these parks because people shouldn't have been going too far away. Yes, I imagine we'll get a lot of local people. And, and again, I, I know that like the, the national park campsites have been booked up like literally within within minutes of them going live. Yeah. Um, so, so can I, you get, can you, have you found out if you can access the people who signed up for entrance last year and make them your um, mail out list for their comments. Interesting idea. We could explore that. That's a good thought. Um, there's very strict, so we've been in touch very much, we, we've been working closely with Parks Canada, where um, they have, we'll, we'll note that for now, yeah, we won't get in, we're, we're trying to figure out the role that they feel they can play. They've been um, saying that they have to limit their involvement for various reasons. Um, so, so that's definitely something we can explore further. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, Cesar, quick comment. Yeah, just, yeah, I'm, I'm aware that, you know, we're supposed to save larger discussions to the end, but I guess, I guess um, I'm a little worried, perhaps it's a shared worry that I have with Kathy and in, in terms of not finding uh, enough participants, right? So could we potentially broaden the, the, the time window to two years, right? Uh, that may be one way to to address it. Uh, the second thing that I'm worried about is that um, it, if, if we want to sort of make the parks more accessible uh, by just narrowing uh, or looking to individuals who have visited a park in the last year or two, we may be missing people who just choose not to go because it's not accessible, right? And so, uh, yeah. Uh, and the last comment is I know that uh, it's, it's not uncommon for a specific park to have a group of volunteers that look in a certain capacity at a, a specific park. So they'll have like the friends of Algonquin or the friends of, you know, that, that type of thing. Uh, I'm making this up, uh, <laughs> right? So, so perhaps that would be an avenue to reach out to potential participants as well, right? So. Yeah, yeah. The, the barrier, yeah, who doesn't go to parks? That is something we did talk about, uh, but we maybe need a another survey specific to that. Yeah, good point. Can you do it virtually? Like we will they, do all of it virtually. Yeah, yeah, the surveys are like all- give them, give them like a, a walkthrough video. Oh, as a way of getting, get, yeah. letting people see what uh, they, they want to comment on. Is that what you mean? Yeah, so, so if people haven't been, Right. Um, because they were worried that it wasn't accessible or because they weren't traveling because of COVID. 
and they really wanted to go to Banff, but you know, Alberta was off the chart for them. Maybe these volunteers or local people or however uh, you get it, could do some kind of a video, you know, a day at Banff and do a bit of a walk through visually. So people who haven't been there or haven't been there in the last year have something to react to. Yeah. Great idea. Um, I'm wondering, yeah. yeah, I mean, maybe this is again, conversation for later, but uh, the field visits that the, that the team members are gonna do, we're also gonna take photos and videos and maybe that's how we incorporate that into the, the survey for people who haven't been to a park, but would like to go to a park. And maybe that's, we ask them questions on, these are the facilities we found that are available at park X. Does this meet your needs or not? Uh, I had thought exactly about um, this aspect to do it at a live. I think documentation is absolutely crucial. So photographs and videos that you're describing now, so I think it's, it's, it's great. I just think that there's a lot of value to doing it live as well. And if we can also record that, I think I think providing that along with a matrix to to the funding agency will be extremely valuable for them, right? To, to, to see the example at, you know, here, I could not use this washroom. We've talked about washrooms a lot last time, right? Or I, I, it'd be nice if there was a, a barrier right here to make sure that I don't fall off uh, when I'm walking this pathway, right? Anyway, sorry. Good. <laughs> well, yeah, let's just keep moving so we make yeah. sure we cover all the topics. And, you know, this meeting is scheduled till five. I'm happy to stay after if there, you know, to capture all the discussion if there are other yeah. ideas. We'll go to Mark. Thank you. Oh, yeah. So I'm, I'm focusing on a scoping re review and, um, yeah, uh, there's been a long exploratory phase of getting a sense of of the academic literature. Um, and in the course of doing this, I think I've just highlighted some of the areas where there are people speaking on the topic in, in some capacity. I don't think there's anyone speaking directly to this question. Uh, so, uh, and maybe the next slide, please. Uh, Allison, yeah, thank you. And so this is kind of a Kind of a an early phase of the what the search the search strings components are going to be it's be much more comprehensive than this uh, this is from uh, web of science um, but kind of trying to break it down um, into it uh, the main concepts into its um, corresponding subcomponents that would be you know fed into the um, to the data particular databases um, next slide please I think in the course of doing this, I think what's going to be more important is the gray literature. And the gray literature typically means literature that isn't kind of through the traditional academic publishing routes or book publishing routes. A gray literature is a concept that kind of came around in the 1970s, 1980s. Um, and it's struggling in, in the world of the online environment uh, because now everyone is potentially a publisher. We see that with Kevin and Dee, who are a non-traditional publisher using a, a platform like YouTube. So we're been looking into this into how to systematically search that space. Uh, next slide. Now, one of the things to keep in mind in doing this is that systematic reviews and scoping reviews come out of the biomedical fields, which has a very well-defined what's called a hierarchy of evidence. So things like randomized control trials are at one level, but you know there's this, a hierarchy of, of what's considered uh, desirable. And that does not fit in this context. There is no randomized controlled uh, trials for the structure of, of picnic benches. Um, so we have to kind of adapt and think, okay, well, what is it that we can't to think constitutes evidence in this case and that we want to draw in and, and learn from and integrate into that matrix? And I've come up with a, a kind of a schema of seven categories. Uh, I want to start first with uh, um, um, We'll step through each one of these here, but th this is it. Um, I'm gonna the first one. I'm gonna put at the end. I think the first one is um, advocacy. So these are sources where we see people asserting a desire for change. Uh, this is an example from the CBC where a, a fellow in a wheelchair uh, wanted um, uh, uh, hot springs in, in I think in BC to have a wheelchair ramp. On the right, we see. Uh, a petition from change.org calling for accessible um, washrooms with certain fe uh, features like lifts and change tables. Uh, so this is evidence of advocacy that we tap into. Uh, next, and he, oh, here's another one too. This is from a human rights tribunal. And this is a particular case uh, in BC where uh, um, a boat launch was um, uh, a fellow 
took this to the Human Rights Tribunal saying, hey, it wasn't accessible. So these are all sort of sources we uh, draw in for that. Um, there's evidence too of, of people who are making changes. Uh, this is uh, Caleb Macquarie. Uh, he's from um, Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, I believe. And he helped bring uh, about change to the local beach, making it was considered to be the most accessible beach in Canada. He's won an award for it. Uh, Kevin and D, uh, he was in one of Kevin and D's videos. So these are people making changes. Uh, we also have um, evidence of people make groups making recommendations. So these would be disability centered groups that are posing recommendations for, for changes to standards. Uh, the CNIB Foundation and the Canadian Heart of Hearing are two examples here. Um, then we're looking at regulatory documents. So these would be things like the United States Access Board Standards. These are kind of um, enabled through legislation, as well as we have the Capital Commission's uh, uh, standards for best practices for outdoor accessibility. Uh, that's kind of a, a guideline. So these are documents that are meant to regulate these outdoors, outdoor spaces. And we're trying to pull in those ones. Uh, another category that we've identified uh, is evidence of outdoor recreation. So these are people with disabilities just having fun, enjoying life. Uh, on the left is the BC Mobility Opportunity Society. And on the right is, it's called uh, Camp Show. That's a, a, an outdoor camp for the CNIB. So there's lessons to be learned from these groups because they're making it happen, you know? It's not to say that there isn't struggles, but they're just going on and, and doing it. They're not saying things need to change. They're just having fun. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this one is unique. And I think it's very unique, even in the context of the academic literature, and that's bringing park experiences to people who can't go to the park. So on the left here, this is a children's hospital um, uh, in, I believe, Texas, and the kids have uh, cancer. And so they bring park experiences, in, outdoor park experiences to the, to, the to the children because they can't, uh, they can't leave. On the right is a recent story in the CBC. It's an Indigenous uh, seniors home. Uh, and they cre recreated outdoor experiences uh, of hunting. So <laughs> very uh, endearing picture of the, the support staff dressed up as um, oh, uh, uh, deer and, and animals, and they had Nerf guns that the, the residents were shooting. So again, bringing a park experience to people who can't go to the, go to the park. And next one, and this is a new category that, and this is based off a discussion I had with one of the uh, uh, advisors, uh, David Willows, uh, and that's, there's a category I think that's important and that there's groups of people who are exhausted and recognizing that people with disabilities and their care providers uh, just have the, can, ha can have ongoing struggle that it just becomes normalized. There's burnout, there's exhaustion, they're in survival mode, and there's no energy to advocate. And that's, I, I don't know of a strategy to engage with it. Maybe it would be through sort of some of the interviews or surveys, but it just to acknowledge that there's some people that, um, who are very much would benefit from the outdoor standards who might not, we might not be able to find in the literature quite in this typical way. Uh, next slide. Uh, some conceptual work that needs to be done in this. Uh, because of the scale of the, the, what we're searching, the you know YouTube and social media and the web, it's enormous. Uh, I think another approach is to treat searching as a, a process of detecting problems and solutions. So we're not aiming to be exhaustive. Uh, we're aiming to uh, kind of get to a level of saturation that, that we're confident that there's no new problems or solutions being heard. Like we, washrooms, uh, parking, uh, trails, you, it's very easy to, you, to, to come across these. They're kind of the easy ones to detect. The, there are other ones that are much more difficult to detect. The idea of bringing a park experience to people uh, at uh, who have disabilities who can't go to the park, that is a unique thing um, that I think we detected in the course of this already. So there's a bit of conceptual work to, to, to think about, you know, what is um, what does it mean to get to that confidence level? What does it mean to be saturated? Um, yeah, so that's my, uh, my bit. And this is where uh, Hossein and I had a quick chat earlier about how there may be some innovative methods that we should be thinking about applying to this. So in parallel with the actual scoping review that Mark is going to lead uh, the design of and the process for, you know, we, we can talk. Hossein, do you want to just say any, anything, a few words about this, uh, your experience with this or what you know about this? Sure. So 
I don't say much of my experience, but what I've seen that people have done, and we can um, we can adopt the methodology here. But recently, people have tried to use machine learning in order to um, consider a very massive uh, database. I, I can say like thousands of papers or different references, and then looking both at the words and relationship between the words. Uh, in the references so that they can make conclusions based on that. People have done that for identifying uh, major problems, let's say in um, rehabilitation, for example. Um, let's, uh, let's consider an example. What has been noticed a lot about um, conditions or, or, or complications um, and the priority for uh, any, any given neurological conditions? What do we know about that? Um, is there anything that is um, simply forgotten or has not been paid attention to in the last decades? Um, uh, people do recently use machine learning techniques in order to um, make this big take home message out of thousands of papers that no one can read. Uh, maybe that's one solution that we can, we can try here. And if you do that, it would be super valuable because as Mark said, um, I, I hear that uh, there are lots of aspects that are unfortunately uh, we don't see them in the recent literature. Now, maybe a few decades ago, uh, they have been paid attention to uh, and the problem has been solved or simply it was not solved because technological advancement at that time was not suitable. But right now, the problem that was uh, noticed many decades ago, suddenly we have technologies that can, that can address them. Uh, that can be a good idea. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So, you know, I, I, I sort of see, I'm not sure if this is exactly what you're getting at, but, it, you know, we're the manual process that Mark will go through and the rest of the team when we, whoever the reviewers are, will be labeling papers as ones we want to keep versus one, you know, exclude, include, whether that we use that as a training method to, you know, repeat this, this, you know, it could be useful just for repeating it in five years time. We could set this up so that someone else could run a similar search later down the line, or we could select a bigger database and, and, and turn it loose on, on a bigger set of data. So uh, yeah, great. Thank you. You can move on, Allison. I think we've got some comments popping up. Yeah, it looks like Kathy, you've got some, you're putting in some links for us. Do you want to comment? Yeah, I just put in a bunch of random links. Um, keyed on the word age friendly. And I don't know if that's something Mark has run across or not, but um, there is a gigantic um, initiative that the WHO started over a decade ago and that has been adopted in all countries and down to the municipal level including the Canadian government. So I am absolutely sure that the Canadian government, you know, would um, be totally tuned into this age-friendly initiative. So what makes a community age-friendly? What makes a park age-friendly? That's a lingo that they would understand. And if you go on the Government of Canada website, they have a methodology for how to evaluate, you know, if your town or your facility is age-friendly. So we should probably take a look at that and, and um, be as, uh, have as much synergy with it as we can. And of course, a lot of older people are going to have you know, some mobility problems and some sensory problems and some cognitive problems. So they're kind of you know, the ultimate cocktail of disabilities that if you actually had an age-friendly place, it would be uh, you know, accessible. So anyway, I don't know if you've thought about that, leveraging that literature, but I think it might help to organize an approach using a well, you know, honed approach that would apply to all kinds of venues. And then you can just say, oh, and now we're doing parks. Fantastic. And, yeah. And sometimes parks are in these documents, um, sometimes urban parks, but, you know, we can generalize. Yeah. Yeah, we were, we were, uh, I think we have had some debate about this table. If, you know, how do you combine 
you know, of, of the different types of impairments you might have. How do you combine them? There's, you know, all the different combinations you could imagine, but age friendliness is one very practical way of combining a number of these issues in a way that, that already other people are dealing with. So it makes a lot of sense that that might be a focused uh, row within our table as if we imagine it that way. That's and, great. and, you know, the deadline for abstracts for the Canadian uh, gerontology association meeting is the end of April. So if you dare, we can put in a, a symposium on uh, age friendly national parks and, and invite a discussion on this. That's an excellent thought. Okay, I'm gonna make a note about that. Thank you. And I'm adding the terms age friendly gerontology to the, as, as kind of searching terms in that, that master list, because it might pull in something. I, I think there's gonna be a bit of a challenge in that I do think this project is responding to a, an existing gap and that's why accessible standards uh, accessibility standards Canada you know came to, into existence uh, like if we look at the American Disabilities Act in the United States that's 1990 and so it, there isn't this a long period of time to to pull into the literature about responding to the needs of people with um, with disabilities and I think that that's why there's a drive to look out at the at the gray literature where that uh, those ideas and the, the responding might be coming from. Okay, why don't we keep going? Stakeholders? Yeah, so I'll just run through it quickly. Um, I have Accessibility Standards Canada here. I mean, obviously they're the funding body and they're not a very active participant as a stakeholder, but they are ultimately who we are accountable to, to, to produce this research. And then Parks Canada, because they'll be the ones implementing these standards and guidelines after the fact. So we wanna make sure that any recommendations we make take into consideration what Parks Canada's mandate is and that balance between environmental preservation and you know, access for all. And then obviously people with disabilities and caregivers, the people who go to the park already, people who want to go to the park, those are ultimately kind of our primary stakeholders. And then we're also kind of in touch and, and working with a few different organizations, nonprofits and uh, companies. So um, CNIB and Accessible Washrooms for All, we've, we've talked to different people from these organizations. And then Action Track Chair and All Trails are different companies that are um, Action Track Chair make um, like off-road wheelchairs that people might be able to use hiking. And All Trails is an app where if you wanted to go hiking or go for a walk, you can find accessibility information about how um, accessible the trail is, if it's paved, wheelchair friendly, um, challenging, easy, et cetera. So we're working with these companies, kind of helping, learning from them what their resources are that uh, they're, they're using for accessibility information and, um, and just sort of keeping in contact with them. All right, so uh, one of the primary outcomes of this uh, research is the matrix. So you've heard it a lot, this uh, discussion. Uh, we keep on talking about the matrix, so I'll be uh, talking about it more here. Next slide, please. Okay, so the accessibility matrix, uh, again, it's one of the core outcomes of this research. Uh, the idea of it is that we envision it to capture all the issues that uh, need to be considered at national parks. And uh, the cells of this matrix will be populated with solutions such as accessible devices, um, recommendations, um, etc. So these will be in the cells. And uh, we recognize that we will have some gaps uh, within the matrix. So for that, we will have a list of uh, future work to be uh, added to the reports uh, down the line. Next slide. So instead of showing you the matrix all at once, I wanted to build it with you uh, just so that you have a clear understanding of it. So if you can Proceed. Yes. So here on the left, as uh, Tilak has uh, mentioned earlier, we have a column uh, which essentially lists down all the specific limitations that are categorized by the functions. So we have the mobility, sensory, cognitive, and neurological, as well as their, uh, you know, their subcategories of them, which are listed. Um, so in, in here we can, uh, as Kathy mentioned, we can he even have a row here uh, talking about age friendliness. So that's a great suggestion by you, Kathy. Thank you. 
Um, next, Allison. Yes, here at the top we have the uh, top row, which essentially lists down um, all of the different things that you can do at a park. We have came up with this uh, category list uh, by using basic facilities, features, and park activities and experiences. So uh, collectively as a team, we came, uh, we collected all the different activities you can do, and then we put them under these categories. Um, now this is just a snapshot. Uh, this is not all of the lists. Uh, the real, uh, the the whole matrix, it's it has a lot of columns. Um, okay. Now next, Allison. Here we see uh, these are the cells of the matrix, which have the solutions, recommendations, or devices uh, that essentially helps. Uh, so, for example, for a certain group of individuals who suffer from a specific limitation, in order for them to access the washrooms or change rooms or parking, you know, that cell will show an example, will show a device or recommendation or a solution for 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 uh, to to make it easier or more accessible for those uh, group of individuals to participate in. So if you uh, advance, yes. So for example, here we can see uh, the swimming, um, swimming activity. So in order for uh, mo people with mobility uh, limitations to participate in swimming, uh, we have uh, researched uh, a couple of solutions, uh, such as the Mobi mats, Mobi chairs, and the buoyant wheelchairs. So Mobi mats they help uh, people with uh, mobility limitations or essentially everyone uh, because they're just mats that are laid on sand so they help uh, everyone to get get into the beach so that's providing access to the beach Moby chairs and buoyant wheelchairs they help uh, people with disabilities to uh, access the water so to float on the water so essentially they're chairs they help they are there for people who have who are using wheelchairs to sit on them and then they can float in the water and enjoy uh, the water as well as swim Okay, so that's a snapshot of the matrix, um, and yeah. So here, here, this is some of the solutions that uh, I was just talking about earlier. So, for example, in the top right, we see the Moby mats, uh, which essentially uh, you see them like they're laid, they're a mat laid on sand, and they're really helpful for someone who has a wheelchair or any wheel uh, to to go across the beach. Uh, so, for example, they're not limited to people with mobility limitations, but for example, we see a man with a with a stroller and he's pushing it. So, uh, they're helpful for everyone and they make everything more accessible for all and not just for people with mobility limitations or not just people with, with wheelchairs. Uh, in the bottom right, we see the sand cruiser, which is essentially a chair that helps people to navigate through the sand uh, without the chair being stuck. So that's just a device that's really handy. Uh, and in the top center, we have the Moby chair, which is the chair I was talking about earlier. Uh, you know, you can have people with mobility limitations who are using wheelchairs sit on it and they can float on water. Also, you can have people with, for example, uh, cognitive limitations or who have some balance coordination or maybe who are blind. They can even use this chair and, and float on water. There's does not limit uh, people from using it. So it makes everything more accessible. In the center, we have the action track chair, which is what Allison was talking about earlier. Uh, it essentially allows uh, for people to participate in hunting uh, or more uh, wild terrain uh, because of the nature of the chair. In the top left here, we see a man, a, a blind individual who is using the safe uh, rail, um, which you can see he's putting his hand on. So this allows uh, him to uh, navigate the park better and then to stay oriented and uh, it's there for safety. We see concrete uh, a pavement, or, or we see pavement in the bottom there, as well as we see a lift uh, on the left. So this is just some of the solutions we have came across. These are not all the solutions. We have come, came across with more solutions. However, I just wanted to share these with you to give you an idea of, of how we are progressing. Okay, and yes, as I said before, uh, we recognize that there are gaps that are present within our current matrix. And just like Kathy said, you know, the idea of uh, talking about the age friendliness, that's a great suggestion. And I think that captures uh, that that's something we did not really uh, discuss about within our team. However, uh, of course, we will talk about it more after this meeting. So we may consider uh, adding that to our matrix. Uh, other things that we have considered but have not categorized yet in our matrix uh, are things like dwarfism, uh, non-commuter users, people who use uh, service animals, uh, children. When you have children, you have to worry about uh, you, you have to worry about them all the time. So they may pose some some limitation to you. 
uh, for example, you have a stroller, so you have to worry about pushing the stroller. You cannot push a stroller on sand, so a, a Mobi mat will be really helpful for you. Uh, so yeah, these types of things, uh, we recognize that there are some gaps within our current matrix, but we're working towards making our matrix more uh, inclusive. And uh, in order to make our matrix more inclusive, uh, w when we come up with all of these different, uh, like when we add more to our matrix, we will uh, probably, uh, we will have some sh shorting, we will essentially run out of solutions. So we may come across uh, so some solutions uh, down the line. So for example, in our team meetings, we will of course have a lot of really good discussions and those may bring about a, a new device. So we may be combining some couple of devices into making a single device that will benefit a group of people that we have not thought about before. Uh, so the active research, active brainstorming will potentially generate a device or two devices maybe. Uh, I know I'm being optimistic here, but uh, I I'm sure like maybe with we're putting time in an effort, we may come across a really good device that will help some, some group of people, um, hopefully. <laughs> okay, so next. The report is another uh, important outcome of this research. The report and the matrix are, you know, they work hand in hand because the report essentially supports the matrix in, in a way that in the cells that you saw earlier, each of them, as I said, they have solutions, recommendations, or devices, assistive devices, and each of these, they need some explanation, you know? Uh, when we state them in the matrix, they're just there, but we need to talk about how do they, uh, to, to who, who are they gonna serve? Uh, so they improve the accessibility for whom? Uh, we need to also talk about the usability standpoint. So can you use this device by yourself, or do you need someone to be there beside you all the time? in order to use that device. So this is the idea of independence and how independent can, uh, can someone with a mobility or any limitation be, uh, or do they have to always be by their caregivers? We, c we are also gonna talk about costs, so how much will, will these take to implement, as well as complexity need time. So how long will, will it take to, for the park to implement such a solution? For example, it, it may take a week, a month, a year. So we want to look at the timings um, and and reports uh, right about them, as well as we want to uh, look look at how invasive will the solution be to the overall park experience. Uh, when this solution is implemented, will this, for example, uh, um, is it gonna affect the the park experience, or is it gonna just be there and it will help out everyone else? As I said before, the Mobi mats, although they may look kind of maybe weird in the in the in the beach however they're they're essentially really helpful for everyone because i'm sure like for myself when i walk on the beach it's it's hard uh, for, for me like it sometimes becomes difficult or if someone who has a stroller or someone who who is have some uh, coordination problems or balance problems it will be better for them to use to use that mobi mat so when looking at at that from that perspective really it's not only really invasive because it's gonna help uh, make the whole park more accessible. As well as the report will be available in both of English and French. Um, so yeah, that's all about the report. So we're just doing a time check. We're kind of in our last two minutes. If everyone still has a couple more minutes to give us, we can provide a quick um, view of our website. Yeah. So. Um... I've been working a little bit on the development of the website. Um, I can potentially share my screen if that's any easier yeah. to show that's the awesome. website. Um, so websites, it's live up and running. Can everyone see my screen? Uh, yeah, so it's accessibleparkscanada.ca. Uh, we have uh, a couple of pages that we have made live so far. Um, and the objective really is with the website to provide that transparency with um, not just people who know about our project, but people who are eventually trying to find um, accessible, uh, either trying to solve accessibility issues for parks out there as well. And then we'll be able to really truly uh, showcase the work that we're doing, who our team members are. We've got our team page running as well. Um, I have a few people whose pictures I'm still waiting on, these are being one of them, um, but no pressure. Uh, we will be expanding on this uh, soon as well. So that is up and running. Um, and our kind of objective in the long, long run, um, I'll stop sharing my screen. 
but we do have a few things that we wanted to address down the road as well. Um, some of the future work for the website includes uh, some blog posts that we may actually have. Um, yeah, so we've got, um, so partnerships page, we've been talking to a lot of the companies uh, for the assistive devices. We're just gonna include them on our website so that people can sometimes maybe have a one-stop shop to kind of see all the accessible devices that are out there. Um, we're gonna be having blog posts as well. Uh, some of the uh, recorded team meetings may be going up on the website and we may have interviews with individuals who do have lived experiences um, as well to be showcased on the website as well as potential featured parks. Um, and yeah, so I think the only item uh, on the agenda is just if you haven't sent your headshot yet, just please send that to me and I can add that onto the, to the website. Um, yeah, that's about it. Perfect. So we are at 501 and I know some people may have to head out. So feel free to do that. Um, if you do need to head out, feel free to send any thoughts you have to me or to the team and we'll, um, you know, we can get in touch with you if you want to discuss further. Um, I'm happy to hang around for a while if, and, and those that are able to stay, feel free to hang around and we can, we can discuss further. Um, just the last note, I guess we're planning, I think right now we're thinking we might do a monthly meeting like this and, uh, and this time we, it was a lot of us talking and, uh, unfortunately, but we'll obviously we'll get into a, a stage where we can, uh, uh, you know, the majority of these meetings will be for discussion. I have two quick things I can mm -hmm. say. Please. So when um, Zayad did his presentation, I was kind of, um, uh, I think we need to go over the labels on the matrix, especially yes. the Y axis isn't, that is not how it should look. The, the, the terminology that we're using. Yeah. Yeah. We, we've been struggling quite a bit to figure out what the best terms are. So we'd love your feedback on, yeah. on so those we, terms. We go over that sometime, but yeah. Um, and then the other thing is this, um, what Allison was saying about having team members go out and do things in parks. Uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure where you, a lot of you live in Ontario. And Cesar, are you in Alberta? No, I'm in Toronto. Oh, Hussein is in Alberta. <laughs> Hussein, yeah. Yes, I'm in Alberta. Allison, Allison, in Alberta. Allison yeah. and I am in BC. So I see there are seven national parks listed for BC, all of which are places I wouldn't mind going. Yes. So I think we need to assign, if you think any of, you know, like who is going to be assigned yep. to these locations and is there a budget for the visits? So yep. those are practicalities that, you know, maybe COVID will be over and, you know, we can actually do this, but we should put it, we should plan it, you know, so that, yep. Yeah. That's a yeah. great, that's a great suggestion, Kathy. I, <laughs> I, 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 I support it. <laughs> strongly <laughs> yeah uh, originally we had budgeted money to go to you know one of the mandates for this program was that a substantial portion of the money go to individuals with disabilities so we really like i think half of our budget might have been in some form or other honoraria or payments to individuals with disabilities to go to the parks and report back to us so we're going to have to revise the the agreement with the funder and say, well, yeah, we can't get ethics to do to do that. What we're proposing now is that our staff or our team members do that, and um, instead, and so yeah, there will be a budget certainly. Or, to travel, travel you know, expenses. or like like I think what Cesar said was, you know, if we want to do like a a live interactive visit with some stakeholders. Yes. And, so and video it, you know, we would have to go with them. So maybe it's not an either or. Yeah. The, the other thing just to complement on that is, I, I mean, I find it kind of ironic that the REV would put a stop on this if we're bringing someone, regardless of physical ability, like this is someone who is basically becoming part of our team, right? And not only that, but they're able and willing and hopefully happy to go to a park and, and record this. So, you know, that's, that's I think it, I think weird. it really just, I think you're right that the health orders, you know, are going to probably apply to the participants and to us. Yeah. But 
you know, yeah. like right now, right now in BC, nobody is supposed to go outside of their, yeah. you know, so many kilometers. You can't even go from one part of Vancouver to the other, according to the medical officer of health of the province. So, you know, just nobody should be going anywhere um, right now, but hopefully that will change. And when it changes, you know, maybe then we will have ethics to involve people, but yeah. It's so we can try. So certainly as a, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not against putting in an application and seeing how, what we can do with that. The con we had a conversation with Vera at, at Toronto Rehab, who's a, you know, our kind of touch point on these kind of things. And she said it would be, she felt it would be very challenging um, to, to have people, especially people with disabilities going to parks, you know, vulnerable people going to parks where there's really you know, where we don't define ahead of time what they will do, um, where, you know, if, if it's truly like uh, an individual planning their own trip and going on their own, there's just so many unknowns and, and potential things that could go wrong and how we could mitigate the risks in each of those cases, I think is, is uh, the potential risk. So, you know, I, again, we can try this. This is an issue that also Parks Canada was quite surprised to hear that it would be difficult for us to get REB approval for this. Um, so, you know, I, we're certainly not against giving it a shot, uh, but just not pinning our hopes on that, I guess, and waiting to get the approval before we- So approve. hold on, so you're saying not because of COVID, but just because of general liability? Yes, yes. Like if someone were to get hurt, right? We, we have at UHN, they're very, strict even you know our consent forms almost they always want to put a line in that, that says if someone gets hurt during you know if someone gets injured as part of a research project the you know the investigators are responsible for all medical costs you know they always want to say things like that so that yeah at the end of the day how can we be sure that the person is not going to get hurt on the trip, regardless of COVID? You know, I'm imagining maybe not this summer, but definitely next summer. You know, I think there's good chance to believe that um, that there won't be COVID-related issues. Well, I have to imagine that the parks have waivers if they give, you know, camping permits or whatever. Or there must be something on the ticket you buy, so they're not responsible. Anyway, I will look at your ethics now with that in mind, because... Sure. I'm on the Social Sciences and Humanities Ethics Review Board at U of T. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you would not believe the research people are doing in this university. They are going to, you know, third world countries um, doing interviews with criminals, you know, who could be sentenced to life in prison or executed for talking about the things that, you know, the anthropologists are interviewing them about. And our big concern in that committee is, is somebody gonna wind up in prison or dead? Yeah. Uh, because, you know, they're not supposed to be talking about these subjects. So, so I, I sit know, on the U of T. It can happen. And I sit in one of the U of T. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I sit on one of the U of T boards as well. And I have sat on the UHN ethics board and I can tell you they're completely different, right? U of yeah. T is far, far, far easier to get through than UHN is. UHN is way more um, is is way more protective of, of participants, and especially the rehab board. I find that it's it's really very hard. very like you have to you have to yeah you have to justify every little possible risk and and how you're mitigating it. It's it's you know I, I it'll take us a year to get through. I, I have no doubt it'll take us a year to get through UHN ethics if we start if we go down that road. So doing it virtual would be a quick way to start. Yeah, yeah. If uh, I think also there's issues about uh, informed consent. So on that chart that uh, you had there, you know, dementia has to be on that chart because of the national dementia strategy. And as soon as you say dementia, people are going to say, are they competent to, to provide consent? Is there an alternative decision maker? And the same with children, you know, if it's a child with a disability, the parents will have to, you know, anybody under 18, there's all kinds of other hoops to jump. So anyway, I'll have a look at that with some of these things in mind. And Thank see you. I, I have a couple of things to mention. Uh, 
just in case it lands on the right ears in this conversation, right? But these are just things that I noticed throughout our conversation. The first thing um, has to do with the matrix. I don't know if this is uh, appropriate or not. I also noticed that the language, we probably need to be a bit more careful and revise that, right? Uh, but I also noticed that it's very sort of engineering driven. It's all about technical solutions, right? But I think an important aspect would be the skills that are available at the park. Right? And this is something that, that was mentioned in, in the video that uh, was shared by you, Mark, in the first time. It's like, it's great that this, this, this attendant, like this, this guy that works here in the park is able to assist with setting up the straps and all these things in the, in the mobile chair, right? And that could potentially even extend to more safety related issues. Like, is there a, a defibrillator on site? Like, what type of, of, of training is there, right? So, it has to do more with the training of the staff at the park, right? Potentially, and um, there's 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 uh, there's one thing. I think I have a feeling that if we start working with someone who works in therapeutic recreation, or at least occupational therapy, they're gonna be able to, they may be able to help us a little bit in this in this area, right? And uh, there's a gentleman. Um, uh, Linters, who is a, 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 a therapeutic, a rec therapist, right? <laughs> but he also has a spinal cord injury and he continues to be quite active. He skis and things like that. So, so, so individuals like that may actually uh, be quite widely on this. Uh, what else did I want to say? Uh, during the, your, your slides, uh, 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 Mark, I don't know if it's important to consider something that has become more and more common these days, which is virtual visits. So is that an accessible portion of, of a park? I may not be able to physically go there, just right, but, but I can tell you that in the last month I visited Egypt and, and <laughs> other places in these really sort of geeky <laughs> presentations that people put together, but they're wonderful. Right, yeah. they have these these local experts. Uh, they don't necessarily go to the site, but they will collect. Uh, you know, they will they will. Um, uh, uh, that's a term that I can't remember what it is, but basically create a collection, curate a, a series of photographs on websites and things like that. That all of a sudden, you know, has a little bit of an element to that, right? So I don't know if that's something that should go also into the search strategy, again, uh, uh, or, or or not. I think I think it might have to go into in the matrix along the, right. the top row uh, as an act an activity of virtual engagement uh, yeah. a, a non present engagement because I definitely think that that's something that a in the time of this the COVID response we're pro I, I gotta bet Parks Canada is already trying to come up with virtual tours and things like that right. um, certainly I, I've seen them exist I Parks Canada does have uh, activities for home uh, I like you know. Uh, create a campfire in your, not, not a real campfire, <laughs> yeah. but, you know, have a camping experience at home. Yeah. And so I think that that could be grown on. And if anything, maybe this is uh, an opportunity to really recognize that that is something that may be really enhanced um, because there's just so many people that, that can't even safely get out, out the door. Um, but it's still under kind of a human rights framework, have sort of some entitlement to an equivalent experience as far as possible. Okay, I think that's it. <laughs> Anything else? Otherwise, we can adjourn for today. And if you if you do think of anything else, we'll we'll we're happy to take in um, other other ideas, other suggestions. You know, as we go forward, if you think of something after after we adjourn today, um, do pe how do people feel about kind of a monthly uh, one hour? connection like this to offer an opportunity for us to keep iterating on what this project is looking like as it evolves. Does that sound reasonable? Kathy, Hossein, I don't, you know, obviously we're not expecting everyone to come to every meeting, you know. You, I'm, you, you, I'm, I'm kind of imagining you'll want kind of smaller groups working on certain things. And that's right. Like yeah. I think that matrix needs some fixing with the terminology. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that, uh, uh, yeah. You know, but we can't actually get much done in this meeting. This is more of a yeah, you no know, sharing of where everybody's at. So I expect you'll be asking for specific things in the interim. 
Yeah, that's right. That's right. We're we're planning to break it down into smaller groups based on uh, you know the scoping review and the the matrix and the report. Uh, I'm website. also. I just uh, had an idea. So, you know, if let's say you want to go to the parks in BC, and you know that would be a fun thing for me to do if they'll ever let us out of our you know ten kilometer space again. But I can think of a person who is fabulous who um has been through all it's a big story anyway he is a wheelchair user who actually now um has has been able to to do some walking without his wheelchair when he was in rehab for his um um his initial paralysis he he just said i you know i want to go sailing and i'll make you know get enough wheelchair and other equipment so I can go sailing and I want to go skiing and and he went skiing like he just didn't say no to any of these outdoor things um, and um, so he's got a lot of personal experience but he also is an ENT doctor and he's been an advocate for the hard of hearing mm -hmm. so we could ask you know like I could say okay let's ask Graham and we could make him a committee member but he has the lived experience. So, so he could go out and visit these places, but he could be a committee member. Yeah. So if we wanna have like special informants, um, maybe they don't have to be participants exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that is the workaround that we were kind of thinking. We've, we've actually hired someone from the CNIB to be a similar role, play the similar role for someone who's blind and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hiring her for uh, five hours a week and she'll she'll review, you know, review all of our materials and make sure that they're accessible to someone with vision problems and and uh, as well as kind of play that but role. I, for and us. I think for these park visits, you kind of have to just tackle it geographically, like who's yeah. going to go to places in Quebec and who's going to go to places in B.C. And, and, and I don't think, you know, I think we, we aren't imagining that we're going to visit all the parks. You know, we're not we're not going to try to do, you know, I think the idea is to make sure that we go to in person to a few to get a sense, to get a feel for what are the issues, to make sure that we're grounded in the things that we're, we're thinking as we're, as, we're, um, as we're going through this project. Uh, you know, I don't think it needs to be every park. And in fact, I think we're imagining maybe each of us might go to one or two parks that are nearby, more for us to be able to think about these things and know what well, to look I, for. I, I think that would, again, for because it'll take time to plan, I think if you look down the list of parks and pick the ones mm -hmm. that are your targets, and then we start thinking about who could go there. Yeah. Um, then when the time comes, you know, everybody will be ready to move and you won't be kind of stalled out again. And I, you know, and some of them like Haida Gwaii. Oh, I would love to go to Haida Gwaii. It's on my bucket list, but nobody's going there during COVID for sure yeah. because yeah. it's a, you know, isolated indigenous, you know, nobody should come in sort of place. But if if it weren't for COVID and people could go there, there would be other cultural issues and sensitivities because you know this is the Haida Gwaii's place and you know there would be issues that may or may not be relevant so does that make it a good target because it has some interesting special issues or is it a bad target because it's one of a kind i don't know you don't have to decide that somehow yeah are we proposed to you know when we were initially thinking we would have participants going to these parks we'd said that we were going to focus on areas that more people tend to visit in general the the more popular parks were the ones we would focus on because naturally we would get more participants going to them and i think that's a reasonable way to look at it the ones that are popular are the ones that tend to be um you know i think they uh they would have the potential to invest more in making the play, making their activities mm -hmm. more accessible. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of how we're thinking about it at the moment. So that would be a fun thing to uh, have on the next agenda. Yeah, absolutely. 
Good. I would like to say okay. thank you everyone for the uh, feedback for the matrix. Hopefully next time we meet it will be in better shape. Uh, I did take note of the comments and uh, well, this was well, actually just a snapshot as well of so in the Excel spreadsheet we do have some more um, like even rows but hopefully I'll, I'll go over them uh, with the team and hopefully maybe I can connect with you Kathy sometime offline and we can work it out together if, if you have time else if you some other ideas too. yeah for sure we're always welcome to ideas and very good awesome excellent thank well, you have a good weekend everyone thank you so much for taking the time today and yes. uh, yeah and don't don't hesitate to reach out if you have anything else that you want to want to share with us great take care everyone have a good weekend Bye. stay Bye. safe enjoy your weekend good to see you Bye. stay safe